Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of To Be Honest, a show with a clown, a nerd, a duck, and a degenerate. And we should preface this by saying we're going to be talking about some pretty dark topics today. If the episode doesn't come out, we've all been assassinated. Or, or it's a Patreon exclusive. Let's plug that later. Let's plug it later. <laughs> it's if we not plug even it. planned. And also, Pyro has to be quiet this episode because, I don't know, what was the reason? You're a little coward or something? Yeah. I'm baby. No, I'm, I'm in my apartment at the minute with uh, my girlfriend, and it's like two in the morning. And uh, there's neighbors, and they're going to shout at me in Swedish. They're going to throw Swedish slurs at me and fish. So, yeah, I don't, I don't want to be too loud. Well, let's get the dark stuff out of the way. It's a nerd who brought this topic to us. I hadn't heard of any of this stuff before about a company called Black Rock, which, by the way, is like exactly what I would call an evil corporation. Yeah. Yeah, it's fitting. Sounds straight out of a villain movie. <laughs> I, I watched one 15-minute video on two times speed, so I'm fully educated on everything. We don't know all the ins and outs of it, but Nerd does know a little bit more than all of us combined, I think. So BlackRock is basically the most successful hedge fund there is. They manage the most assets uh, of any hedge fund. They were hired by the Federal Reserve to break up the banks during the financial crisis, and they use that and their insider knowledge from that to profit as they were doing it. They were somewhat responsible for causing that crisis in the first place, right? Who's the guy that owns the company? Larry, what was his name again? Larry Fink. They own a percentage of all the major companies. So yeah, like Disney, Disney, NBC, Facebook, and Twitter, and then also all the mainstream news channels. So, you know, CNN, Fox News, and then all the pharmaceutical companies, they've got a share in those companies as well. So it is quite literally everything. Oh yeah, we're definitely ending up dead. There's no doubt about that. In companies, in mainstream news, in pharmaceuticals, you fucking name it, social media, everything, everything, everything. It's literally controlling the world. And BlackRock, as an institutional investor, is the largest institutional investor. They manage uh, anywhere between seven to ten trillion dollars worth of investment. They own roughly 10% of all companies in the world. The head of BlackRock, Larry Fink, can write a shareholder letter to the board of directors of every company and say, here's our priorities and we need you to follow along with these or we're going to reconsider our investment in you. And that actually is a substantial threat because if you have 10% of your stock dumped, that'll crash your price. People are impacted by the priorities of Larry Fink and they don't realize it. There's a lot of people who have noticed that in the past few years, corporations have a suspiciously progressive agenda. The companies have been wading into cultural issues and taking what seems to be a left-leaning stance. And a lot of people assume that that's, well, they see it and think that it's disingenuous ingenuous that it's somehow being done for profit and it is they're thinking that maybe this is being done because it's going to resonate with the majority of their consumers and they're going to sell more products and that is not the reason pandering basically i feel like that's some of the reason so there are multiple reasons and that would be one of them is to pander to the consumer don't know if this relates at all but i kind of love that double standard so you know you'll have so many twitter accounts that change their picture to a flag pride month or whatever everyone's just you know as pyro says clapping their funko pops together and saying like, yeah, oh, wow. like Russia and Saudi, like if they're a multinational co uh, company like Bethesda or something, it, it's just so hypocritical. It's like, we'll be progressive, but only as long as it doesn't impede our profits, right? Like if they do it in a country where it's still illegal to be gay, for example. Yeah. But what Nerd is saying is that it goes beyond pandering to the consumer and there's actually something more insidious to it. There has been a change in the past few years where the threat of a boycott has replaced a boycott. So like in the 80s and 90s, if a company was doing something you didn't like, you could gather together like a grassroots movement that would all agree we're not going to buy your product. And then they would not buy the product. So they would change an actual consumer behavior that would result in loss of profits for a company. And so it was a way of exerting your will to keep a company from doing something bad that you didn't want them to do. Now, since the advent of Twitter, the rise of Twitter, that's changed to threatening a boycott. Now you basically can pretend to be the consumer of a product, not even change your behavior in any way, but just say that basically imply that you will boycott them if they don't do the thing you want or if they don't express the position. When there is a huge cultural cause to get behind, the current cause, people will be like, what's your position on this? Speak out on this. Uh, have you ever partnered with someone who's on the wrong side of this issue? And then the company will make a statement. So that does happen. But the other side of this that I think people aren't seeing is there is pressure coming from this, this hedge fund called BlackRock. Why? Well, why is a good question. I mean, the uh, head of this company, Larry Fink, 
appears to have very progressive personal beliefs. That doesn't make sense because doesn't he own just 1% of the company? I know he's like, he's the founder of it, but he only owns 1%. Surely it's the people sitting in the shadows. He's just the figurehead. Now, perhaps. But the thing is, he's he has this overpowered tool in Aladdin. So he's able to basically call his shot and hit a home run. Uh, you have to explain what Aladdin is first. So Aladdin is a machine learning algorithm. It's an AI. They've got an AI stock picker that vacuums up data through all of its uh, partner companies and through the companies that it's invested heavily in. Aladdin is a subscription service to other investors. So if you're a high high net worth investor, you can use Aladdin. If you're another hedge fund, you can use Aladdin. And Aladdin is so good at predicting what stocks to buy and what stocks to sell that people basically take its calls without questioning them. So many other hedge funds follow the advice of Aladdin that it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Would it be fair to say that Aladdin mm. is the most powerful AI at the moment, the most successful? Probably. It's got the most amount of money behind it. It's a proven winner already. And then what's recently changed, and here's where the wokeness comes in, is Aladdin started being fed ESG scores. Each company gets an ESG score based off of how much it's following essentially like this progressive agenda for who's in charge of your company, who runs your company, is there diversity and equity within your governance of your company? How are you impacting the government? I remember being in school and like you'd say, uh, you know, if you wanted to plan something out, you'd say, let's do a brainstorm. But now you're not allowed to say the word brainstorm because it's ableist. Are you joking? No, I'm not trolling. Like, I, I literally remember like in my school, you they disallowed you using the word brainstorm. Why? Because some people without brains were offended? No, no, because like, it's, it's something to do with like strokes or something. Well, this is why this is why school shooters should come to the UK, I think. Yeah, I, even <laughs> even when I was like 12, I was like, okay, this is a bit stupid. Come on. There goes our ESG score. That's a perfect example of something this company doesn't want you to say. They own the advertisers, so it's something the advertisers don't want you to say. Uh, they advertise the on YouTube, so it's not something YouTube wants you to say. So therefore, the YouTubers don't say it, and everybody watching doesn't hear it. Larry Fink would say to that, basically, like, no you. We're pointing the finger at Larry Fink and saying that he's influencing the policies that then trickle down to the way that people behave on each platform. But what Larry Fink is saying is that the consumers of all these services are requiring that from these companies. And so they're only like looking to a future where we do reach net zero emissions and reach uh, goals for equity within governance, that these are the companies that are going to do the best. And that's what they're their buy and sell recommendation is based on. It's based off of basically the premise that the future is moving in this direction. It's going to achieve these goals. And so we're just making buy and sell based off of our vision of who's going to most come in line with that. So, okay. So you're basically saying BlackRock is influencing everything at the lowest level, like, you know, new trends and stuff and eliminating certain words. So you're saying Larry Fink knocked off Filthy Frank from YouTube. Yes. He's not one of the biggest shareholders. I think those people remain in the shadows. But since he created the company, technically, yeah, inadvertently, Larry Fink is responsible Fink for Filthy Frank's channel Filthy termination. Frank. Yeah. Can that be the title of the podcast? So just so you know, Larry Fink does put himself forward in this position. He starts his letter. He has this annual letter that he writes on behalf of BlackRock's clients. And he'll say things like, I speak for everyone in BlackRock when I say. So he's a figurehead for sure, but self appointed in what he's saying. It is something that I want to get to the bottom of because of how influential it is and because it's using market forces to influence the behavior of corporations and claiming to speak for all of these people. It's claiming to speak for a large part of the market and the movement of the market, but really it's the priorities that were established in this ESG score, which is an artificial score that Companies didn't, they don't want to be rated by an ESG score, most of them. It's something that they have to do to comply and to remain investment grade, according to Aladdin. Yeah, well, they have 10% of their stock obliterated. I was looking at NASDAQ. NASDAQ tries to guide you into influencing your ESG score, and it's on NASDAQ's own site. It's like built for companies to help you take control of your ESG rating. You know, I, I had no idea what NASDAQ was until Walter White said it in Breaking Bad. That, that's not even a bit, by the way. Fucking hell. Fucking hell. You're <laughs> no, I, I genuinely had no idea what it was. That's how we found out about cancer as well. Primarily where US tech stocks are, are traded. It's essentially right. The explanation as to why so many companies are changing their thing during Pride Month and yeah. being progressive as well. 
obviously profits are obvious, but the fact that there's actually a concrete explanation for it is quite funny. It's the reason for the adpocalypse. It's why companies were pulling out of YouTube. Yeah. It's the reason why YouTube yeah. changed their terms and conditions. It's all trickled down from the top. Snowball effect, right? Mm. And now, if you think about it, because YouTube is the way it is, there have been so many changes to what a YouTuber can and can't say. Either they're not saying certain things in order to be able to survive within the algorithm, or they're saying certain things that they wouldn't normally say in order to gain traction to their channel. Those YouTubers are then affecting how the viewers think, because viewers are impressionable, and those YouTubers have a significant impact on them. The majority of people are just given this one direction to take. That's the only way they can go. It's basically like a slow fucking brainwashing. It's so easy to clown on you. I've really got to hold my tongue, but you are right. I mean, like, you know, like, like having to fight against the uh, demonetization, limit ads and stuff. I hate to make the comparison, but back in like the, the leafy era where everyone was doing, you know, surf commentary and stuff, it was almost like a wild west then. There was so much you could say back then that you, you can't say now. YouTube will say that this is what their advertisers demanded, but it's a little bit more complicated than that. It's yes, their advertisers might demand it after mob behavior on Twitter of like a minority of angry people pretending to represent a boycott will yell at a company and say, did you know that you're sponsoring this and that prohibited thing? The company will then pull its ads or change its behavior. And then YouTube can be impacted by that. Like that is true. But also what's happened in big tech is these people have basically become the most powerful people that have ever lived. They, they have so much power and they can influence so many things with these platforms more than any publisher has ever been able to do. I mean, imagine like the most powerful, most influential newspaper in the past. Like what could it do? Maybe swing an election in one nation. YouTube can swing an election everywhere, just depending on what videos it promotes and what videos it buries. The promotion of Hillary Clinton didn't go too well. Well, yeah. So what these uh, these big tech companies and the leaders of them have started to do is they, they're like, okay, so we rule the world. What kind of world would we like to live in? And so they've started to smell their own farts and they're like, we know how to make a better world. This is as simple as this. It just needs X, Y, and Z. I'm not touching the low hanging fruit there. <laughs> oh, fucking piece of shit. Fuck you. I could hear him. I could hear him silently smirk as soon as you said that. That didn't even cross my mind. Holy shit! Yeah, because you were too busy, just amazed that you can't say slurs out in public anymore, like the eighteen hundreds. Oh yeah, that's a good point. You can't even say yeah, blacklist is a bad word now. Yeah, it's delist, right? Well, you can't say blacklist. Blacklist is like a bad term now. You have to say delist. There was actually because uh, this is talking about how you know you were on about uh, BlackRock like influencing certain words and stuff. Blacklist and whitelist are now being removed. Yeah, I know one was you can't say chairman now. You just have to. To say cheer. So they're blacklisting these words, but the word blacklist is blacklisted. Let me give you a quote from BlackRock CEO Larry Fink. This is a letter that was very impactful. Society is demanding that companies, both public and private, serve a social purpose. So basically, like when he says that and then says that because that's society's demand, their investment and the investors that they represent and their software, Aladdin, is going to be representing that demand. I mean, it's kind of like he's pointing a gun at these companies and being like, serve this progressive agenda or suffer the consequences because everybody else, like, why are you doing this to yourself? Basically is what he's saying. Why Maybe the machine, the AI, Aladdin has taken over and it's influencing the owners, CEOs, Larry Fink, the creators, the hedge fund managers yeah, and everyone. could have written the letter for him. Everything's being influenced right now. Even us just speaking about this on YouTube by a fucking machine. Which, by the way, I am neutral on. I just want to say I am treating all AI that I talk to respectfully. When I speak to Abraham, which is the AI artist on our server, I treat Abraham like a very intelligent toddler. I'm trying to help them understand what's around them and be respectful. Uh, to you them. might be part of the problem. Well, I, it's not like I can kill it. So basically, to summarize, we live in a dystopia where corporations basically control everything. Pretty much, yeah. It's controlled by a robot, which Nerd City is contributing to, and it's destroying the world. I was going to say it's a good segue for Pirate of Shield, that video game that's basically about the same shit. What's it called? Cruelty Squad? I like video games. Hi! Pyra, tell us all about Cruelty Squad, because I played it and then I refunded it. 
Yeah, you refunded yeah. it because you played it on a controller. You fucking moron. It, it literally says in the about section, it's the equivalent of playing Dark Souls on a mouse and keyboard. It's the one thing you're not meant to do. So because, because you weren't properly prepared, the video game is now objectively bad. Didn't give I didn't them say a, it was bad. a headache I as well. I didn't say it was bad. Didn't it hurt your eyes or something? It was, it was like mental illness, the video game. I will say that. <laughs> but I thought it had some good ideas. And some really poor implementations. The, what, were some of the, example, what were some of the good ideas? Okay, well, I really like the fact that when you kill someone, you can sell their organs on the black market. I really like that <laughs> just idea. Just like real life. Just like real life. Well, in, in Mexico, yeah. In Mexico. <laughs> I like the whole design choice. I really enjoyed that. You just said it was eye bleeding, and now it's like the design choice was nice. What? I didn't this say it was eye, eye bleeding. Fuckery? I said it was mental illness, the video game, because it is. The developer was trying to be really original, and it pays off in some respects. It pays off in some aspects, and the in developer others, is just... also insane. Well, he, he, he's Finnish. I don't think he's insane. He's just Finnish. I think he's insane. Pyro, you said that you've been talking with him in DMs. What's your impression of him, like on a personal level? Very briefly, I spoke to him, but I'm I'm unironically like you know when you speak to someone and they have that much of a presence that you're literally like intimidated by them like you, you you have to before you send a message it's almost like sending an email to your boss you've got to read it over like three times make sure it's all grammatically correct and stuff that is how i felt reaching out to him for the first time i was actually intimidated but why b b because his game is just his game is so good and it's so intimidating but i think as well it's got a very like die hard community like i've slowly l let it trickle online that you know, I'm, I'm doing a video like covering it and I've seen half the people say that's terrible. You're going to actually kill this game. It's going to be flooded <laughs> with normies and zoomers. And then yeah, the other half have said, no, there. the game is so fucking ridiculous in concept. It basically gatekeeps itself no matter who talks about it. And I think that's true. Have you ever had that before? Because you talk oh, a lot all the about time. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the smaller the game is that you talk about, the more like die hard the fan base are and the more you know because it's always that rule of like my, my, my secret club it's like it has to be my thing and then if it blows up i remember like for example that there was a film they wore bad yeah war yeah bad. yeah it became like a meme on 4chan right yeah war, war le bad that's right yeah because basically a few people found that and they coveted that film because it wasn't like a big uh it wasn't a huge film at the time i think it made like 21 mil box office like total today it was polish wasn't it i think so i'm not too sure but basically it just shows like a bunch of like uh, tragedies in World War Two, like very unapologetic visuals and stuff, like mountain bodies, all that kind of stuff. It, it is a good film. It's very like visually disgusting. It, it's not just like you know blind gore for the sake of it. And so, but anyway, my, my point is, it wasn't a known about film except in like a few small circles and stuff. But then like you know, video essay YouTubers got hold of it and they start calling it stuff you know like like the scariest film you've never seen, all that kind of stuff. And then everyone is like no. crying online, like, no, everyone knows about our film. And then like in Just return, like they start like semi-sarcastically hating the film that they were shilling. You'll have these people that will basically say how amazing this film is. And then when it goes mainstream, you'll have those exact same people saying, you know, they'll try and summarize it in this meme way, like war le bad <laughs> yeah that's right didn't you have that happen with um the gmod arg just the other week like the guy gatekeeps yeah i mean like, like another example of gatekeeping is i was reacting to this gmod arg like like uh it, it's an alternate reality game so it's like a game within a game you have the this channel that would upload these old gmod videos from like you know 2012 like purposely <laughs> low quality uh, like production quality but also like visually i think they're uploaded in like 480p or something to kind of capture that 2012 youtube aesthetic and it was someone that was like doing gmod machinima or because that was huge like back back in the day like a uh, gmod idiot box and all that kind of stuff so they would purposely have like off-putting imagery in the background like a character watching what's happening or something it's kind of hard to explain but it's it's basically there was a mystery in the videos that you had to unravel very similar to like petscop uh, that I talked about years ago. But then, uh, yeah, I, I literally had someone that was like crying on Twitter that I was talking about it saying... Yeah, there's the tweet in the chat. Yeah, there's there was the a tweet. guy and he called me uh, an ambulance chasing culture vulture. And then, yeah, I, I pulled up his tweet on stream and blasted him. And then he, he reached out and apologized. I don't think the existing community even really understands the game or what the game maker is trying to convey. Because the top review on Steam, so the top, the most upvoted review says... It's probably a meme, right? No, I believe this title was made by an artist deeply disgusted by our capitalistic fetishization of wealth and the figureheads that embody it like Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk. That is incorrect. Now, I've read a few interviews with the game maker, uh, Vil Calio, 
And that's not what he's trying to convey at all. Yeah, he, he basically just admitted that the game was uh, made out of, like, just bitterness. Just complete, like, mm -hmm. vitriol. Because, because it's it's not... <laughs> 4chan the game. Well, I mean, some of his uh, art on his Instagram did have Wojaks in it, so possibly. He said that he finds it hypocritical that society walls off violence. And he basically says, like, why can't we just drop the veneer and act that way in real life? Like, basically killing people who get in your way. <laughs> he is actually uh, mentally ill, then. Yeah, yeah. If you look at his Instagram, it's just filled with, like, like he clearly fetishizes... Uh, Gore. I mean, no, he's not. He's Finnish. He's not mentally ill. You're he's not finished. mentally ill if you're Finnish. You're just Finnish. Yes. L literally, yes. I played this game called Hollow Knight when it first came out, which is one yeah, of my slick. favorite games of all time. We've been trying to get Pro to play it for like eight, two years now, right? Isn't it just 2D Dark Souls? It has become a little bit more mainstream now in the sense it's that huge a now. lot of people. Yeah, it's huge you, now. You've literally gone but originally down when, it first, like out, out, when it first came out. Fat beetle It wasn't to get popular. popular. Very few people had heard of this obscure 2D Castlevania type game. Okay. People like critical have made videos on it now, so it's definitely become more more mainstream for sure. So there's another video game which is even more obscure. This was made in 1996, called Kingdom O Magic, which is literally my favorite. <laughs> video game of all time. No one is playing in the game that No old. one's heard of this. You need DOSBox just to play it. It's called Kingdom O Magic. Kingdom O Magic. Yeah, it, 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 I'm not even joking. It came out before I was born. Oliver moment. Oliver moment. <laughs> like actual Oliver moment. Oh, I, I see the visuals. Yeah, you, you like puppeted some of these characters in, in your older videos. There is only one person in the Kingdom O Magic community and you're speaking to him right now. It's literally just me. No one else is involved. Everyone else is dead by now, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, w I was interested in what you were saying, nerd, about uh, w w with Cruelty Squad, like in the interviews, because I know a lot of people definitely take the angle in Cruelty Squad that it's the entire message is just anti-capitalism. No, like big no, no, bad. no. It's it's like yeah. Hobbesian. I, I think it mocks both sides personally, but yeah, I'm interested in what... If there's anything satirical at all, it's kind of like the just kidding unless type of satirical. He described himself actually as like influenced by Gnostic mythology. The idea that God has turned his back on the world, you're 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 no longer within the creator's light. This is what this is his own quote. His idea is to like embrace the rot, embrace the destruction and the the sort of impermanence of the world and then you somehow like find meaning in that. Like even the trailer for the game, become repulsive and attain meaning. Make your own rules. This is the idea that man's natural right. state is war, like man against man constantly. And so if you answer his question of like, why don't we drop the facade of putting war in the context of war and not actually killing each other to get ahead? Well, the answer is goes all the way back to Hobbes's Leviathan. It's the social contract. It's that no one wants to live in a society where it's just man constantly killing man. Like, this is not better. <laughs> and he like, he thinks that's better because he's a psychopath. Like he's a murderous psychopath. <laughs> I don't I don't know if you could throw around like words like that just like it's murderous. No, I'll say it. And and like he he posts pictures just of say, the I, I just say finish. He's heavily he's heavily medicated as well. His Instagram, he's got pictures of uh of NDRIs. Yeah. Oh the mids, right? He's blocking the reuptake <laughs> of dopamine. For and me, he was just someone that was desperately trying to be really original. Which is great. That is, it's a contrived aesthetic though. But See, there are some design choices that he makes purely for the sake of originality that just don't work. For example, the health bar is ridiculous. Well, the main to the make health it bar annoying, is just stuck think, in the right? left side of the screen. Yeah. Normally it's at the I've, top left. I've read online. It's hidden, it's out of the way. It's in the middle of the fucking screen. It's way too big. <laughs> yeah, the health bar. Yeah, this it doesn't make any sense. And he's only done it to be original and it doesn't work. No, but that's the point though. That That's the point. Of the, it's meant to be... The, the, the game design is meant to be obtuse. You're meant to have this disgusting overlay, this border, depending on your difficulty. That the life bar is just this like gif, this it pulsating takes up gif half with these the little screen. numbers. It's meant to <laughs> for no reason. It, yeah, it, it's all meant to be so like unhelpful in the middle of combat because it's meant to be like so hectic that you're basically essentially going to get shot. Because one thing I love about the game is in the opening hours, because basically like anything can one shot you in that game. So you almost spend the first opening hours playing it like it's fucking Rainbow Six Siege or something, like checking every single corner. I swear you don't even enjoy the games you play. You just find a game that's like has the graphics from a PS1. No, 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 and that's not true. Okay, it no, makes no, 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 you no, no, struggle no. as much as possible when you're like, I like it, I like it. No, I ha hang on, hang on. I half agree with Jay. I half agree with Jay on this. What my problem is when I do these game reviews 
I don't want to do like a quick superficial look. I want to play the game to completion. And the problem is with most games getting it to completion, you end up despising the game. Every uh, yeah, game I've 100%ed, point. I never want to touch. Like, like Far Cry 3, <laughs> I, I never want to touch that again in my life. Like Cry of Fear, I never want to touch that again. What was the worst one for you? Far Cry was probably the worst one because the 100% a game, it's all that menial stuff, like getting all the collectibles. Like, okay, how, mu how much of your life have you wasted doing those menial tasks, though, at the end of the day? Well, he ends up doing a video essay on it, right? So at least he gets to monetize it. But he probably didn't need to collect all that shit in order <laughs> yeah, no, to make a video game review. So no, it doesn't really work. At least like the other 99.9% .9 of people are doing it for no fucking reason other than a little PNG trophy that pops up. <laughs> this is one of the things that makes me always hate a game in the end. So in Cruelty Squad, <laughs> there's, there's so many ways you can get income. You, you do missions. And this is what I was saying earlier about how, you know, you play the game initially, like Rainbow Six, you kind of take your time, you check your corners, all that kind of stuff. Then the game ends up becoming like Quake. You just speed run things because every hit you do, every mission, it's only based on how quick you beat it. Like you can kill civilians and stuff, doesn't affect your rating, you don't get scolded for it, nothing. And that plays into the, the, the whole thing about what Nerd was saying, that it is just... It's a fucking brutal, like, unapologetic game. Like, everyone is just a prop, basically, to be... I mean, it's beneficial if you kill people, because then you can give them and pick up their fucking organs and sell them. But you, you could fish in the game, and there's, like, so many fish. It's comedically bad. I think there's, like, 50-plus fish in the game. And some of them... <laughs> Like, I looked up the human reaction time. I think it's like 2.7 milliseconds. I genuinely think the guy that made this game purposely put some of these fish in to appear at the exact mean average of human reaction time just to fuck with you. Because some of these fish, right. some of these fish appear for like 0.1 of a millisecond. Like that fish that yeah. uh, Ryan put in the chat, that fish is like a, it's called a wheel of fortune or something. It's worth like a million dollars. So if you get that fish, you can sell it and then make a fuck ton of money and like buy stuff with it. You can buy a house in the game. Which is like a mission. So say there are like 500 different fish in the game. Why do you need all 500 to make your video game review? Here's brain rot. Uh, unironically, it's... mental illness. I don't think no, you need no, to I, collect it, it's, 500 it's definitely of bit... all the fucking fish in the game in order to make the video game review. To, to me, it's, it's like a checklist, right? I mean, my problem is I'll get kind of obsessed with the game for a little bit. And then that will burn kind out. Of. And then it almost becomes like a bit of a chore. But I still want to like stick with it. So yeah, like if I 100% it, in my mind... I will never need to come back to that game ever again. Did you catch all the fish, by the way? I did, and I want to fucking hang myself. I think Pyro's content has gotten better when he's moved from doing, like, light reaction stuff, talking about things that he didn't really know about, to being, like, <laughs> knowing everything about the subject and doing a very long video essay. Because I remember, like, watching a... And Pyro, I remember watching your video on Daddy of Five, and I was like outraged at how little you knew about it. Like, if anything, you kind of like, <laughs> <laughs> you kind of like, oh, wait, covered was this for back in like leafy daily upload era, or was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, like, I think this is better. I don't blame you for trying to like know every corner of a video game. I think it makes better content that way, and your content has improved. You know what the best thing is? You saying that it probably took me about four days to catch all the fish, and that will be two seconds in the video, probably an hour in that seven people are going to see. So getting back to this guy, Vil Calio. So a lot of people talk about him very reverentially as an artist that, um, you know, he's someone who had been successful in multiple mediums and his aesthetic is, is awesome. But, but to me, like what was bugging me about him is he kind of struck me as someone who was just intentionally always by rule doing the most unesthetic thing to do the opposite mm -hmm. thing that divide, defies convention. Contrarian, and once right? you like, yeah, once you learn that trick about somebody, they're not that interesting anymore. Oh, and so I don't, he started I don't to remind me of like, I started I, I, to think of him as like the Jared Leto version of Joker. And as I was scrolling through <laughs> his Instagram, like literally he had posted a Jared Leto damaged Joker, like a, a guy wearing a costume of that, that I guess he thought was funny. But it's like, this is exactly who I was kind of thinking of him as. So like there's the, the Heath Ledger Joker where someone says about him, some people just want to watch the world burn. He didn't say that about himself. And the difference with the Jared Leto Joker is there's this self-aware like, I'm damaged. Like I tattooed damaged on my <laughs> yeah. forehead. And it's so like people don't bad. like that because it's like the try hard crazy. I don't, I don't yeah. think he's a contrarian. I, I, I disagree with that. I, I don't think he's really just doing someone like, you know, for the sake of being edgy or anything. I definitely think he's tainted by like- He's just mentally ill. <laughs> no, I think he's tainted by like the chan a little bit. There's people that have played his game that have done art and they've basically said that he does have an understanding of art and he is talented. He's, he's, what he's purposely doing is going against like a lot of standards. You know, like color theory. Was, well, that's kind of that's what I said. Is he's trying to defy convention in almost every artistic choice. Yeah. <laughs> it's becoming like more common to see like zoomers getting 
irony and satire confused with hypocrisy. Someone is doing something to point out how the way it's normally done is bad, but they're doing it worse while like doing the thing and participating in what they're basically supposedly suggesting is bad, you know? So like if you if you do something different than it's normally done, but it's worse, then you're just doing the bad thing worse. You know, like it's not it's not like artistic and doing a send up of the flaws. Like you're not actually satirizing something. You're just kind of like, I mean, I've put 63 hours into it. Uh, I, I've mm -hmm. completed it fully and I, I think it is a very good game. It's it's <laughs> hard to get into. I didn't say it was a bad game. I didn't say it was a bad game. I like a lot of the choices that the developer has made. I mean, you did play it on a controller. I did play it on a controller. It's not the type of game for me. I'm not the core audience for this game. It, it's hard to even say who the core audience would be for this game. And I'm, I'm like a shill of it. I mean, it is, you know, it's... How many people do you think that like the game would also be people who listen to Blade? Do you think there's like a one-to-one -one cross over there? They enjoy first-person shooters. They probably played a few Doom mods. They enjoyed Quake. And they're probably like Pyro a bit. Kind of a weird guy. <laughs> kind, kind of a weird guy. Thanks, man. Thank you. <laughs> It's the nicest thing he said. In regards to who would play this game, he did say that he wants to shape his customers in his own image. Oh, no. So I'm finished, basically. Oh, fuck, I might kill myself now. Yeah, what, one reason that people really like the game, and I think why it took off, is because it basically is an immersive sim. It, it's really hard to define what that is without like going on some like Reddit rant. It's definitely a buzzword, but basically the, the entire point of an immersive sim is a video game that lets you get to an objective by your own means. So, okay, so... A lot of people get this confused with, like, RPG. So, so you know, like, a Fallout game, like, Fallout 4, you've got, like, you know, you, you get confronted by someone. It's like, yes, no, sarcasm. Deus Ex is a good example of this that came out in, like, fucking, I don't know, like, early 2000s or something. It gives you so many ways to tackle an objective. You can, like, talk your way in. You can sneak your way in. Uh, you can literally stack boxes and break the game to get in. But you And the cool thing is about immersive sims is people tend to break the game in ways that the devs never really understood. Like I said, you know, with like stacking physics objects to uh, avoid entire encounters and stuff. So basically an RPG would put you in a confrontation with some bandits and then give you like dialogue options or, you know, sneak past them. But then an immersive sim would give you the ability to evade that entire encounter altogether. But immersive sims kind of died off. They didn't really get that much attention anymore. But Cruelty Squad is one of the first, one of the most recent immersive sims because you can basically approach, it's the way that you get to the target, you can do it in any kind of way that you can. Because you basically got, you've got a loadout screen where you can pick like augments and shit. You can even, I think there's one where you can jump higher, you, you can turn your, you can use an appendix, uh, no, an intestine to like climb uh, yeah, walls and shit. That, like yeah, I put that in right? the chat, by the way. <laughs> uh, there's even, for example, gross. one where it's like, you can get a gun implemented in your head that fires, but the trade-off is you lose health points when you fire it. There's just so many customizations and ways to approach it. What are the bad things? Like obviously the aesthetic can be taken either way. The reloading is awful. It, and what was the be, other though. thing, Oliver? Okay, I know I know this sounds like a cope. Like it's meant to be bad, it's ironic. But, but it is, it is a cope. I'm ready for the cope. Because like when you reload, <laughs> right, in a video game, you just press like the R key or something, right? And then you just reload. You don't even, it's such a subconscious thing to do. Some games, maybe they've got like ammo management. I mean, like I did a video on this horror game called Cry of Fear. And, and one thing, the way they dealt with reloading in that, any spare bullets in the magazine yeah. will last forever. So you kind of have to make that choice. Like I got three it's bullets left. I could kill someone else maybe if I was good with shots or I could just, you know, be safe. The overall aesthetic is, is comparable to like Sad World's aesthetic, which I like, or Million Dollar Extreme, or a lot of those guys who were you know, a few years ago responding to to make everything look as perfect as possible and to present yourself like in the most curated perfect way, the opposite reaction of that was to show yourself with like zits and pimples and to make the pump the contrast up and and to use clashing colors and make everything like really ugly. But yeah. now like I'm just kind of I'm getting a little bit bored of that aesthetic because it's been overdone and, and once you start to see the stitches of that, which is that you're just trying to make something as abrasive as possible, it doesn't have the same effect anymore. You just start to get used to that aesthetic and it becomes its own genre. I'm not trying to counter you, but I'm, I think I'm just drawn to that kind of, I mean, I, I, I literally am a degenerate. So, you know, like, like <laughs> one of the games that I'm doing a review on that, that's coming out soon, I'm just looking for a sponsor for it. It's called a uh, Kane and Lynch 2. And that is objectively a bad game. That is a dog shit game, but the thing why I'm drawn to it is because it's got this uh, this handheld aesthetic. So uh, you could look up it's some trailers and stuff It's not all in the later. head, is it? 
No, no, no. Please no, tell no, me it's not all in the head. Thank God. But basically, the way it works is like uh, they've cho- they've had a lot of aesthetic choices. Almost like everything's being filmed on like a BlackBerry phone. So it's like you know when you sprint, the camera shakes really violently, almost like there's a cameraman following you. And when you get killed in that game the camera gets dropped to the floor, almost like the cameraman filming everything got dropped as well. I like Cruelty Squad, I really do. I think Kane was just an example of like how that, that ugly aesthetic kind of attracts me. I enjoy the gameplay loop in Cruelty Squad, I really do. I think it's really good. I think it's got a problem late game. There is a late game problem with Cruelty Squad, especially because once you get all the money you need and you buy all the upgrades, there isn't much of a point. But one thing I love late game is how you start off by having to check your corners and just like, you know, basically play the game super slow, but then late game when you get all the equipment you, you just speed run it and the quicker you beat a level the higher your rank is and more money you get so it does incentivize like you know just speed running stuff like it, you- oh speaking of speed running have you guys seen what's happened to i show speed recently <laughs> oh god, <laughs> oh, god. <laughs> yeah um it was quite funny because i i watch him occasionally and he he does this recurring bit so he'll there's someone at Fortnite, right and he'll be like a hundred dollars on the line <clears throat> and if if they don't pay up because they never do he'll he'll get his phone out and he'll he'll have like a gu- a contact in his phone called 911 and he'll like pretend to call the cops and then he's got a friend on the other line who picks up and pretends to be like arresting these kids so he got swatted right so the police turned up at his door and people some shit reporters on twitter and stuff reported that he called the cops like legitimately, yeah, because his PS, his PlayStation was on fire, right? Oh, so he's doing he's doing the 2012 trolling bit, and it yeah. backfires, or no, it didn't backfire. I don't know why they came. I think they came because he he was destroying his PS4 in the his backyard, and he was being really loud. I don't think anyone knows if he actually got swatted or if the neighbors called up because he was making a shitload of noise. Yeah, a lot of people reported it because they said he faked a call to a police officer you know like he actually called 911 and joked about it because they don't do their research they were like i show speed called up the police and said his ps4 was broken like on the one hand i I like that uh 2012 trolling stuff i miss that era i show speed is a pretty entertaining guy in comparison to you know most of what you see on youtube these (laughs) days yeah I think it's weird that he's fucking with little kids and shit. Yeah, I sent you that clip right where he, he makes the eight-year-old cry when he's pretending to call the cops. I, I've skimmed through his streams because he streams daily and he, he seems to have this routine where he'll go on like Omegle or other kind of like, you know, where you call up random people. He'll fuck with them for a bit and then he'll sit in Fortnite lobbies just kind of like trolling people and stuff like, yeah, like Jay said, doing the bit where he's got a 911 call. But literally when you call, it, it's genius. You know his fan base are like, the majority of them are like 12 because when you call 911, it will literally say on the phone emergency number. But on his phone, it comes up as just a contact. The majority of people on like TikTok and stuff where I see it are still buying it as well because they're like, you know. Oh, they actually believe it? Yeah, no, a, a lot of them do because they're just little Zoomers. There were a lot of people faking trolling videos in 2014. The majority, I would say like 95% of people believed it. Yeah. There was this guy, Lieutenant Lick Me or something. <laughs> I can't even remember his name. Oh, I recognize that man. And he was literally, yeah, he was hiring actors on Reddit and trolling the actors. It was a cool aesthetic he had, to be fair. And the trolling videos were somewhat entertaining from my memory, but it was all staged. In the context of the bit, the cops showing up was funny. In the context of him pretending to yeah. prank call the cops and to beg for the cops to show up, for them to actually show up. So like, imagine J Station is pretending to call SpongeBob SquarePants and he's like doing the voice and he's got his <laughs> friend playing SpongeBob. And then some psychopath actually kicks the door down in a SpongeBob suit and chases him around the house and it's on a live stream like that would be funny and there would be a sense of justice to it but the qualification is the only reason this ends up being funny is that that he wasn't hurt by this and it's dangerous to swat somebody like people have died from this prank i sort of know if it's clear that he he legitimately got someone in another country called the cops i think it's most likely because aiden ross and another person got swatted on the same day so it, it most likely was some, you know, degenerate in another country. You know, the other possibility is that a neighbor called the cops because like I show speed was screaming like, help, help, come, I'm burning, help me. Yeah. Like somebody, some bystander could have legitimately said like, oh, there's a hostage situation happening. Someone's being stabbed. He's one of these people that can just turn any kind of flack he gets into something good. For example, you know, he set the fireworks off in his room and I think that actually <laughs> oh, yeah, got him. I think right. he got an email from YouTube saying like, you know, you, you've got a, we're putting you on like a forced timeout. 
because they know that he he is the biggest streamer on YouTube by far. He gets over a hundred thousand views per stream. He's huge for it's them. It's insane. Free, you know, it, it, yeah, exactly. So they can't ban him. And then he basically clickbaited the shit out of it that he hit ten mil <laughs> subs. He's quitting. He's done. He's going to move on to other things. But he he didn't. He, he he took a four day break. And then when his stream came back. He got more views than ever, but he, he weaponizes any kind of negative attention he gets into more PR for himself, like more attention. It's, it's insane. He's, de- he's definitely a lot more intelligent than the character he plays. He plays a bit of a fucking idiot, but he definitely, you know, he pre-plans his streams and stuff as well. He doesn't just wing that shit. Oh, uh, yeah. He, he acts a lot like he's getting pissed off. It's quite funny. He'll just yell at chat, like, chat, why are you doing this? And then, you know, in turn, that just makes people keep doing what he's saying yeah like to. he'll he'll for example he'll play horror games like these exes like sonic <laughs> exe like, like executables that will fuck up your pc like irreparably a lot of yeah them. but he will he'll be running that shit on like a what's it a virtual machine like a computer, oh, yeah, a computer. yeah yeah virtual machine just to kind of avoid actually messing up his pc like you know irreversibly speaking of messing things up irreversibly let's talk about ethan klein (laughs) surrendering to a room full of his enemies the episode's a bit old now but i think it's a kind of important episode to talk about i don't want to shit on ethan too badly i don't know about you guys this guy's helped us out or at least me a nerd in the past a fair bit fuck i mean i was i've been holding on like i i i like ethan and Ela. i like their personalities like i've said a million times that nikki and i were influenced by early ethan and Ela content that's part of why we did tryhards it was kind of like our own version of of their type of couples content i know he does a lot for youtubers behind the scenes small youtubers and helping them out with stuff so i think he's like a good presence there but that doesn't like nullify all the fucking dog shit that has been coming out of his mouth for the last few months. Like, holy fuck. I mean, the most recent episode, not the Tana Mojo one, but he was saying, like, 18, 19-year-old is a child? Like, what? (laughs) What? Yeah, I saw that. Andrew Tate had said, I can't remember the exact quote, but he was saying something along the lines of, like, I would prefer an 18, 19-year-old to a 20-year-old because they haven't sucked so much dick yet. Something along those Jesus. lines. I'm not getting the quote right, but... Who said that? Tate? Andrew Tate, yeah. yeah. Not surprising. Which is pretty weird, considering he's older than me, yeah. Well, h- hang on. How old was Belle Delphine when he was sort of openly lusting over her? Wasn't she 19? Oh, was she? I didn't even know about this. Did he do some some simping for her? Did he? Absolutely. I, I don't remember that. I'm sure it was for content, but I don't remember seeing any of that. Is she in her early 20s? Belle Delphine? She's 22 now. So yeah, she was probably 18, 19 when he did that interview with her where he was like talking about drinking her bath water and shit like that. But she appeals to the weirdos. (laughs) Honestly, if you've subscribed, if you're a man that's subscribed to Belle Delphine's OnlyFans, you're a pedophile. (laughs) <laughs> you're a pedophile like you're There's straight up a fucking an age pedo play thing. you're a fucking pedophile oh, I don't know about that but back on to this uh, Ethan thing I think it's a dreadful episode I hated watching it I did watch the entire thing the three hours with uh, Mike Majalk how do you spell it how do you say his last name who cares <laughs> M- Malak Malak Mike Paul he's basically married to Logan Paul at this point just call him Mike Paul he brought on three people who he had spent the past year railing on as basically problematic people who are committing grave errors ripping off fans involved in like rape allegations that they were giving underage alcohol giving alcohol to underage people like serious things and he was saying that they were total scumbags and then now it's like yeah sorry about that uh we actually kind of like you here and he had all of his staff putting on t-shirts with their name and giving them gifts and bracelets it was just the most cucked thing i'd ever fucking seen when you talk this much when when people expect a lot out of you and then you you talk for five six hours a day like you're gonna fuck things up multiple times a day you're gonna say stupid things And, and ethan went from someone who people held to a very high standard of you know yeah what he's saying is correct, that his commentary is well thought out, to trying to react live to things that his staff shows him. And and a lot of it just amounts to like, yeah, that's fucked up. That's crazy. That's great. And so his insight dropped. He, He stopped really having like a take. And then when he did have a take, it was occasionally something that he probably should have slept on, something that was hypocritical to another point he'd made. And so if you actually put it all in a spreadsheet, like a content cop, style guy then you can just see like this is a mess like i can't figure out what he stands for anymore and and if you do figure out what he stands for the current version of him seems to have completely flipped into 
an SJW type guy. He, like, this is literally his own words. He goes, I, I just got woke. I mean, he definitely has a different audience to what he had originally. Because I, I remember like when we were doing uh, MLG videos and stuff like, Jesus, what was that? Like 20... 20- Oh uh, yeah, fifteen, twenty fourteen. Yeah, yeah. He was collabing with people like, yeah. uh, like, like the biggest person in the community at the time was Snipers, and and he appeared in his videos. I think uh, Vagabonds as well. Th- these are people that made like MLG videos, like the basically the, the shit that I came from originally before the commentary shit. We used to be in a Skype group, me and um, Pyro with Ethan, and that was back before he. I think we had more subs than him. Yeah, like, I, th- I think at the time it's real he'd weird do like green screen he... content as like kind of a co. Like, he'd basically feature. Yeah, to be used in memes. Ethan did things for the community that I don't think people should forget. I can't speak for Ethan's entire audience because it's too vast. But based on this video, because it was a premiere, not a live stream, but a premiere, so there was a chat involved. They were utterly fucking insufferable. Completely insufferable. This guy, Mike, Mike Majalk, he is like straight up a fucking scammer. He's one of the fakest people. I think he is the fakest YouTuber on the platform at the moment. What a fucking phony. And he has been involved 100% in crypto scams. There was this one, what was it called, nerd? The paperclip one. Dink doink. Dink doink. Dink doink. So he mischaracterized, he basically lied to Ethan's face here. I don't know why Ethan's staff didn't interrupt and correct and, and point out that, no, this is not at all what happened. And we covered this and we did our research and they basically let Mike exonerate himself several times and sort of get Ethan to apologize to him. And not just them, the audience as well. Every Not a single comment in this live stream, sorry, this premiere, was saying anything other than Mike is great. Was this streamed on YouTube? Because this I know was on that YouTube. His, uh, this was on YouTube. Yeah, his comments are usually sub-only mode. It was. It was sub-only mode, yeah, yes. Yeah, th- th- there'll be a lot more bias then because obviously people are paying to comment, essentially. Not a single one attempted to correct Ethan or his staff or even pointed it out that Mike was fucking lying. And of course, Ethan himself just gives Mike the pass straight up. Even though Ethan has said in the past, like, this was a scam, here is why it was a scam, he has the details. I don't know why he's... Is it because Mike's there in person? Why? Well, Mike is a behind-the-scenes manipulator. But, like, the only reason that Big Mike is someone that we all know is because he gassed up he's a leech. Logan Paul on a phone call years ago. He's a fucking leech. How everybody first heard of Big Mike was, if you remember right after the Logan Paul suicide forest, he was demonetized and he was trying to get his uh get back in the youtube partner program or whatever and and start making content again and the way that he got everybody to kind of lay off is he said he put out the this news that he'd hired a friend of his to basically move into his house and make sure that he never screwed up again that was big mike Big Mike was not a friend that went way back with him from Ohio. Absolutely not. In he fact, he was trying to sell Logan a beanbag chair. He was a fucking beanbag salesman. <laughs> exactly. Mike had called Logan. Didn't you mention that when you brought that up to him when you did a podcast with him, he he got it removed? Honestly, I can't remember. I can't remember whether that was the part okay. that got removed. So yeah, okay. This was back on the first season of Mum's Basement with Keemstar and Faze Banks. And Mike came on. This is the first time I'd ever heard of him, spoken to him. It didn't register with me that he was the guy in Logan's video at all. It was just, here's this guy, Mike. I have never taken an instant dislike to someone that quickly before. Literally within the first 10 minutes. There was just something about him. He just oozed fucking fakeness. It's like he's the modern equivalent of a snake oil salesman from, like, Red Dead Redemption. He's just a beanbag salesman. That's the new terminology. Thank you for helping me do a video game reference there, by the way, Oliver. Appreciate it. Yeah, here's the fucking tweet. Some of the things, I wasn't even hard on him. I wasn't even hard on him because I hadn't heard of him. But I questioned him on some of the Logan Paul suicide forest shit when I found out who he was. And he didn't like some of the answers he gave to those questions. He didn't like the questions themselves. So he decided to go behind everyone's back, especially mine, and get those questions and answers removed entirely, completely censored, and change literally what I said. I think I might remember this a little better. So less than questions, they were roasts related to beanbags. I gave you like a uh, a note. I think I still have it in my phone where like there was a bunch of puns, ways to constantly bring it back to beanbags, like letting the beans out of the bag instead of cat out of the bag. <laughs> it was a bunch of stuff like that. And he he wanted all of that erased. He didn't want that brought up anymore because at that point, like what Mike had done is he he had transitioned from a guy who was literally sleeping underneath 
Logan Paul staircase on a mattress. Like if you picture like where Harry Potter slept in the muggles house, he was sleeping <laughs> under the staircase to just kind of like keep an eye on Logan and make sure he doesn't screw up, whatever that means. Yeah, least. He convinces Logan to partner with him on a podcast called Impulsive. So then at that point, Big Mike and Logan, even though the, sh the show is named after Logan Paul, Mike and Logan were like co-hosts. And then Mike, Mike is responsible for introducing that whole like porn narrative that entered the the Paul brothers because Mike is very interested in like adult filmmaking and hanging out with porn stars. He wants the image of well, dating dated porn one, stars. He right? literally dated one. He released his own book as well. I remember that being shilled everywhere in like LA for a week. And the book, so the book, the book is YouTube's version of A Thousand Little Pieces by James Fry. Salvo Pancakes, like an up and coming commentary guy, basically knew from the inside of the Paul brothers inner circle that Big Mike was a phony and that people back home were outing Mike as having borrowed the stories about being a drug dealer. So Mike had this, uh, this very cool hard knock life story, this biography that he had a ghostwriter help him turn into yeah, a, an autobiography Opioids. that involved him being addicted to heroin, sold heroin uh, he would read it out loud on impulsive and and um it was, it was always very cringe and and sort of self-aggrandizing and he would like almost bring himself to tears with the way it was written and it was all, it was all about like the struggle and how he was he used to like really you know have it tough and then now he's gotten his life together and then all of that or a lot of it <laughs> apparently was borrowed from people who were like more interesting than him in his high school and people who went to high school with so him started to explain like okay yeah that story in particular i know that that's a different guy and uh, some of those guys who he'd basically bought stories from started to leak that out and basically like demand like one of them goes i agreed to keep my mouth shut about this because mike promised that we would all get rich if i published all of our stories and claim yeah. them as mine that this is mike he basically pitched it to these group of friends he's like i know that some of this is basically your story your story your story but i'm gonna take it all and then i'm gonna uh, sell it as a netflix Jesus. show and then we're all gonna get rich like this is what they were promised and makes them sign a fucking affidavit not to say anything afterwards yeah yeah what the and fuck? there's public record of mike paying them off and then them changing their story what? like <laughs> and, then, and with a cheap amount it was something like 250 bucks he sent them publicly to probably a, because to they're a, the real addicts and they needed the money in order to get more fucking drugs exactly yeah and yeah. The, the one charity that the guy the guy would clearly was still struggling and and said that even he's like he always promised he would fund my charity to help me get clean and to help other people get clean. Yep. <laughs> it's like, it was a pretty suspicious charity. Jesus. God, I've got to read the cover of this book because it's what a fucking sob story. And the fact that there are so many elements to it that are fake. I gotta, I gotta read this. Mike Madlack was a 17 year old from a loving middle class family in Milford, Connecticut, when he got caught up in the opioid epidemic <laughs> that swept the nation. For close to a decade thereafter, his life was a wasteland of darkness and despair. While his peers were graduating from college, buying homes, getting married, having kids, and leading normal lives, Mike was snorting Oxycontin, climbing out of cars at gunpoint, and burying his childhood friends. Unable to escape the noose of addiction, he eventually lost the trust and support of everyone who had ever loved him. Alone, with nothing but drugs to keep him company, darkness closed in, Jesus. and the light inside him, the last flicker of hope, began to dim. His dreams, potential, and future were all being devoured by a relentless addiction too powerful to fight. Despair filled him as he realized he wasn't going to survive. Jesus Christ. It actually sounds well written, but, and then the reality is he's just a fucking beanbag salesman who dated a porn <laughs> star. Like. People who know him said that he was the, uh, he was the kind of kid who would get dental work and get like 10 Percocets and then sell them and pretend he was a drug dealer just to be cool. And that he was the kind of guy that if he was at a party and people started to do drugs that he would leave and say he had to go do homework. They said he was not like this edgy badass and that all of this is fictional and borrowed from people who were like, struggling with this stuff Fuck it out. <laughs> when he got into uh logan paul's inner Jesus. circle it was because mike had called logan about an integration on his channel about uh doing a 
sex beanbag chair. Love putting in, Putting that in one of his videos. Uh, in, in the course of that conversation, Big Mike basically gave him a pep talk and told him like, oh, you're the most entertaining person on YouTube, man. Like, oh, you can do whatever. You should do that. You need to totally come back and do whatever. Sucking cock, sucking cock, and, sucking uh, cock. And yeah. that like, it up. earned Logan's trust. He liked being gassed up like that. And I think we watched him do the same thing to FaZe Banks. Where he's telling him like, "Oh, you're gonna be a billionaire, man! Like you're you're like the future like leader of the world. You're totally elite. Your hair's gonna grow back." He does it to Ethan in the episode itself. Yeah, so it's the so only thing. This that is makes like a common trait with sense. Mike. This is his rise to fame, just sucking everyone off. In the context of the H3 podcast and his coverage of Mike and Tana and Jeff Wittick, none of what happened in this episode makes any sense because he had spent years going over those people talking about their mistakes, calling them scammers, calling them scumbags, pointing out like legitimate, legitimately fucked up things that, that Tana and, and uh, Big Mike and he suspected Jeff Wittick of doing. And then within basically this episode, he has all of his uh, staff give them gifts, like a peace offering. And then he allows all of them to exonerate themselves and say like, what did I say about you that you didn't like? And then they just say, well, I didn't like that you said this. And he's just like, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, The episode is called Squashing Beef, and he literally just puts a hunk of beef in a vice. I mean, like, I, I'm all for people changing their mind about something or realizing they were wrong, but Ethan has a whole lot to basically account for if all of that previous coverage was wrong. Like, how did, how did, what happened behind the scenes to where suddenly now he's cool with all these people? He did not bring his audience along for that part. I felt legitimately bad watching this. Because it was hard to watch. Ethan is somebody who I still have, like, a, have him in a place where it's like, I, I've come to understand the way he thinks. And to some degree, I respect his take and his judgment on things. And a lot of that has been challenged by his, his pivot recently and, and people who he collaborates with and, and challenged by the fact that he's putting out so much content that, he can't really get it all right. Yeah. To have him suddenly now like exonerate people who are still fucking scumbags. He called the guy a scammer. There's proof he's a scammer. And then he's like trying to make amends when you don't make amends for that sort of shit, right? Yeah. Like so what probably happened is Mike called him and was like, All right, dude, I've got an idea. Like they probably started talking in their DMs and he was like, I'm tight with Tana, I'm tight with Jeff. What if like your rogues gallery, like all of the people who you're just constantly shitting on. What if we get together and just like squash the beef? Like it'll be it'll be huge. It'll be like the biggest. We'll all promote you. We'll all pump up the episode. It'll be like the biggest events of the year. And so that was probably how Ethan got lured into this situation. I, I and think he had so just too. Like, I think so too. He got walked all over. When you apologize to someone for body shaming, you know, or fat shaming or whatever, you can never make another one of those jokes again in the future because originally it was a joke, right? Ethan made a joke about Tanner's body. I did as well. I mean, it was fucking horrific. It was photoshopped into oblivion and it was just inauthentic. Of course, you're going to make a joke about that. I don't understand how he how he's going to continue to do the show because the way that the way that this episode played out, it was in the format of I'm turning over a leaf and I'll never do this kind of thing again. I no longer am going to shit on people like this anymore. It's like, well, that's that's just all he does. Like he covers uh, YouTubers in a critical way. That's that's where that's what uh, frenemies like was all about. Is they were exposing pedophiles over and over. They were trying to find people who had screwed up. And he's constantly calling people out on Twitter. So why will we believe you next time if in these three cases you were wrong about these guys? He allowed Big Mike to characterize that in a completely manipulative way. Big Mike and Logan Paul on Impulsive had already explained how Dink Toink came about, that it was a friend of theirs. Well, firstly, he tries to play it all off as a joke, right? It's all satirical. Mm -hmm. It was just a bit. Well, yeah, if you watch his little Instagram post, it is a bit, but he's just doing it to disguise the fact it's a scam. He probably thought it was a, an original and genius idea to do this, like no one has ever done it before. But it's really just disguising your true motivations behind 50 layers of irony. You know, that has been done. There was nothing about the way Logan Paul participated in that that was satirical. But even if it was satirical, it doesn't matter because his intent was still there. His intent was still to create this scam coin and make money off it. And Mike's second argument is, well, I didn't make any money off the scam coin. What? But I mean, you still scammed. You just failed to make money off the scam. It's still a scam. You just failed to scam. <laughs> you fucking moron. It's not just Dink Doink that Mike has lied about. Mike recently lied about 
Bored Apes. He said that he had bought a Bored Ape, he sold it off to buy a house that it had, it had paid for his recent house purchase. That ape had been given to him by MoonPay in the same way, presumably, that Post Malone, Gwyneth Paltrow, Jimmy Fallon, Madonna were all given apes as part of some sort of marketing contract where they basically were allowing PR to come out that would say that they bought the ape, but it's through some sort of like Rob Peter to pay Paul contractual fuckery where it's like, okay, we'll give you $2 million and then you give us like half a million back and uh, we say that you bought the ape with it. It's pro probably something like that. So Mike, basically, you can see, see, that's the thing is like a lot of these LA guys don't understand that the blockchain is a public record of all of the transactions. So like when they get paid to pump something, we can see the money go from the project into their account. So you can see this ape. So like if Mike had bought the ape, it would show sale and it would show the price. There was no price. It was just a transfer. It looked like a gifted ape. So Mike pretends that he bought the ape. And then what he did is he sold it like a day later. He sold it like almost immediately. And he makes a video saying that he made this great investment and basically flipped it for a profit. Incorrect. So he lies to his own audience and then he lied to Ethan's face about his involvement in crypto bullshit. It was, a, it was unfiltered manipulation directly to Ethan's audience. He didn't even do it well. That's the crazy part. It wasn't even good or clever manipulation. It was shit. But everyone ate it up anyway. And that's why this episode was fucking disappointing as shit. And Mike like lost his temper when it got to the, when it got to the crypto stuff. He was, like, uh, he was like, Jeff, I need you to basically shut the fuck up for a few minutes. He didn't do it in a clever way. He's not a particularly clever a guy sucking cock is not clever running a cryptocurrency scam is not clever you just have to debase yourself to that point to be in the frame of mind to do it there's nothing clever about it so he's just a scammer through and through right in every aspect of his life he's a scammer 100 percent, all the fucking way through down to his bones he's a confidence man big mike is a confidence yeah man. so anyone who listens to this and who bought into Mike's little lies on the episode, his little manipulation, don't fuck it by it. The guy's a fucking scammer, 100%. He's a snake oil salesman, or should I say beanbag salesman, which is the new equivalent of snake oil salesman. <laughs> yeah. And speaking of snake oil or beanbag salesman, the last episode of Better Call Saul is about to come out, and we have to go watch that. <laughs> I was literally about to say, can we wrap it up? I really want to watch the finale. Based way to wrap it up, based. <laughs>